Welcome back to Aspen Ideas Reset, a conversation about creating a resilient economy for all. In the sessions we had yesterday and earlier today, we focused on the issues facing the U.S. specifically. But the entire globe is connected economically. Just one more thing that a pandemic has made incredibly clear. Income inequality is a global problem and trade rules and supply chains are a mess. China continues to exert itself as an economic superpower, while trust in the U.S. on an international scale has eroded. After years of America first thinking, how can the U.S. be a leader in creating cooperative and sustainable global economic growth? especially when it feels like we don't have our own house in order. In the next hour, we'll explore global income inequality, the future of U.S.-China relations, and how the U.S. might rebuild its trust with other economic superpowers. After that, join us for three more interactive sessions. First, join former White House economic advisor Adrian Harris, Grameen America CEO Andrea Jung, and MasterCard's Mike Froman about why so many communities seem left behind by economic growth and how we need to send a national agenda for financial inclusion. Or join Reshma Sajani and Betsy Stevenson looking at the employment crisis among women and a proposal to get them back to work through a Marshall Plan for Moms. Then a conversation with Jean Case and Peggy Alford on the state of stakeholder capitalism and its promise moving forward. I'm Scarlett Fu with Bloomberg Television. And I am Joanna smith Romani with the Aspen Institute. Thank you for joining Aspen Ideas Reset. We'll begin with the issue of trust, something that the U.S. needs to lead in the global economy and something that has been squandered in the last few years. What steps must we take to regain our international standing, especially if our allies simply won't forgive and forget? Ambassador Nick Burns and Megan O'Sullivan of the Harvard Kennedy School discuss this with John Micklethwaite, Editor-in-Chief of Bloomberg. I'm John Micklethwaite of Bloomberg, and the theme now is Reset and American Foreign Policy. And we have with us to discuss that Ambassador Nick Burns and Dr. Megan O'Sullivan. Both don't need any more introduction than, than Googling them, and there is a lot to see. Um, in terms of resetting American foreign policy, I think it's fair to say roughly where we are. And I think we're end at the end of an era where America first has been tried and doesn't seem to work particularly well. We're also at the end, or hopefully quite close to the end of COVID. Where I just checked this morning, America is close to 1,500 deaths for every million inhabitants, whilst China claims a number of three, which would make it 500 times better, even if it's lying a bit, that would still be a big gap. And from my perspective in Britain, America has a lot to do. So the issue is, what should America do in terms of rebuilding alliances? And I thought I'd begin with Nick and ask, what do you think is possible for the Biden administration? Uh, they're consciously trying to recreate a global leadership role for the United States after the very weak performance of President Trump. So what are they doing? They've decided they're going to show up where it really counts and they're going to lead. So we're back in the World Health Organization and, and Secretary Blinken said that we're actually going to pay the $200 million that we owe the WHO at a time of pandemic. We're back in the climate change agreement. And I think that's very important to see this historic commitment that President Biden has made to put the United States back as the second largest carbon emitter into the climate change debate. Consciously, you see them third, in addition to showing up and acting on climate, it's alliances. It's the great power differential of NATO, uh, which gives the United States so much strength in the world versus Russia, for instance, which has no true allies in the world. And President Biden at the first NATO defense ministers meeting, they're recreating the historic role that the United States has always played in NATO. I'm a former ambassador to NATO and understand how important that is. And they're doing the same thing in East Asia, where Secretary Blinken last week uh, participated in, a, in the first foreign minister's quad meeting of this administration. That's India, Australia, Japan, and the United States designed to limit China. And then, the, and the fourth thing I think we should do is compete with China and make sure that the United States is using all the um, tools that we have in our arsenal to limit China militarily in the Indo-Pacific, to force China to play by the rules on trade, to stand up in the values debate we're having, where Xi Jinping has been asserting that the authoritarian state model is the right model. We don't believe that. And so you now you see President Biden very vocal 
in criticizing China on Hong Kong, on the weaker, Secretary Blinken calling that um, a genocide, standing up uh, for human rights from Navalny to the people of Belarus. And this defense of democracy is so important for the United States to make. I just want to ask, Megan, Nick, Nick put across a whole series of points which were essentially America getting back into the game. And I suppose I was going to ask you, do you think that's enough? Well, I would say that all the points that Nick made are appropriate, and there are certainly areas that the Biden administration is working on. There are two things I would add. First is, as your question implies, it's not enough for us to just think we can repair our reputation by addressing our actions abroad. A lot of our credibility has taken a hit in the last years because of events at home. And, you know, most obviously, I would say that there are now question marks around America's competence when we look at our ability and the way that we have handled COVID, but also um, the extent to which our democracy really is a model for other countries, I think, was called into question, particularly by the events of January 6 here in the US. So I think the first thing um, is that we really need to keep in mind the phrase, which is now very commonplace, that foreign policy does begin at home. And the second thing I would uh, mention, building on Nick's comments about climate, this is an area where I do believe the United States can really demonstrate um, that it is not only willing to lead, but it is capable of leading. And so I think in many respects, this new focus on climate is a twofer for the Biden administration. At first, it's an issue that the Biden administration and many, many Americans care deeply about the importance of uh, tackling climate change and decarbonizing economies. But then there's also the opportunity to use this issue to demonstrate that America is back on the global stage. But all those things, to some extent, are they're merely coming back into kind of arenas where America has not been present before. And I wondered whether there's anything in this idea that Biden forms an alliance of democracy. He, he reaches out not just to the Europeans, because strangely in Europe, we're not that enthusiastic about being told that America first is the policy. But he reaches out to America, to Europeans in terms of democracy. But he also reaches out to people in countries in Asia. I think it does make sense. Um, President Biden spoke on the campaign trail about a coalition of democracies. And if you agree, and I certainly do, that China and Russia, the two authoritarian powers, are the greatest threat to the United States and to Europe and to our East Asian allies, then forming a worldwide association of democracies, having a summit meeting to work, to, to talk about the strengths of democracy and to work on defending democracy when it's a challenge. It makes great sense to me. The virtue that we already have, of course, is NATO. That's an alliance of democracies. Our Indo-Pacific alliances, Japan, South Korea, Australia, our partnership with India, that's an alliance of democracy too. So I think you can actually have overlapping efforts here. What about this to Megan is that all this sounds, all this sounds wonderful, but surely the main thing that allies, people in Europe, people in Asia are gonna say is, what about trade? Here, here is the thing that if you could really help us, if you got involved in that, if you welcomed us in, but Biden has got quite a protectionist element in his party, quite a protectionist element behind him. Well, I do think that trade is one of the areas where we're not going to see a lot of quick action out of the Biden administration. I think there will be some elements that uh, provide relief from the Trump approach towards trade, which really had this unusual quality of using tariffs against our partners and allies. And I don't think we're going to see a lot of that. But in terms of really spearheading new trade agreements, I think that's going to be slow in coming from the Biden administration. And when it does come, there's going to be a heavy focus on issues like labor and the environment. So I think that isn't the area where the allies are going to be most satisfied, but there are some dimensions that I do think there's um, a lot of common cause. Let me just um, mention on the democracy uh, alliance issue that Nick spoke about, I agree that I think this is a valuable forum for the United States to partner um, with others on. And I think that's because there are a lot of issues out there today that need to be dealt with collectively and that will be most usefully dealt with by a group of countries that share a, a common set of values. And one of them I think about is, is technology and, um, and the regulation of technology and having conversations among democracies about how they're going to handle this, I think is much more useful than doing it all individually. Nick, do you think that's practical? Surely technology is one of those areas where, where the world is rapidly getting divided. Admittedly, I'm, you know, Megan pointed out democracies 
but we've got the prospect of an internet splitting into two with China on one side, the rest of the West on the other. I think it's important and it's very practical. Um, you know, David Ignatius wrote a column in the Washington Post saying there's an idea brewing in the Biden administration, and that is a tech 10, 10 or a tech 12, the big technology company, uh, countries of the world that our democracies need to band together in the digital age to protect our technologies uh, on issues like 5G and others from the Chinese. And so I think it's a very important idea. A second idea, not just on technology, if Japan, the European Union, the UK and US coalesced on some of the big trade differences that all of us have with China, that's well more than 60% of global GDP. That's real weight that we can bring to the competition with China. Can, can I come back to this idea, just, just to use that technology as an example, you, you wander around the capitals of Europe, and I think you'd find quite a lot of people when they talked about let's unite behind technology would immediately say, why should we unite behind big American companies, which we're already slightly fed up with? Uh, isn't this one of those things where America is so excited just to get back into the arena that there will still be real splits with people? I would say that, um, one, the conversation uh, around technology is changing in the United States as well. And I think our partners and allies need to recognize that, that we're having conversations here. And I think there is going to be more of a consensus for more regulation in some respects. I don't know how far it will go, but it's a changing landscape on the part of America. I'd also say that technology is not just about, um, you know, big U.S. tech companies permeating other societies and countries, but it also has to involve uh, questions like, to what extent does America and the West and its allies want to decouple with China and to what extent does it not? I think the, the reality is that we need to talk about uh, this whole question of decoupling and technology with China in a much more sophisticated way. There are areas where it's going to make sense for us collectively not to be intertwined with China, but there are other areas where we're not going to want that. And I think having a common vision, a common understanding among countries is going to be really critical to, to realizing that into practicality. Can I ask you both one question, both to, to, to end? And, and that's what, if you were Joe Biden, where would you be most worried about at the moment? What, looking ahead over the next four years, where do you see the kind of unexpected problems coming from? This is the most obvious answer, but I think it has the virtue of, of being uh, correct, is that the area on the, the international landscape that's most worrying is the U.S. relationship with China. If the Biden administration can find a way to stabilize the U.S.-China relationship, which doesn't mean um, kumbaya, it doesn't mean realizing the vision of a decade ago of getting China to fully embrace uh, international norms and institutions as we saw them, but just to find a way that the U.S. and its partners and allies around the world can peacefully coexist with an economy that is as large and dynamic as China's, but is also underpinned by a very different set of values. If we can find a way to have that relationship, um, again, be stable and be peaceful, I think that'll be a huge opportunity. But going back to your question, I also think it is the greatest challenge on the global horizon for the Biden administration. I agree with Megan. The, the, the most important foreign policy challenge we have is, is competing with China standing up to China, but yet finding a way, as Megan has suggested, to work with the Chinese. But I do think, you know, President Biden has got to think about the home front first. It's the issue that Megan raised. And on issue after issue, from pandemic to recession, to our racial crisis, to the January 6th crisis, clearly the United States needs to stabilize the home front, begin to knit people back together as Americans, so that then we can be successful overseas. The nation building begins at home. Um I cannot think of a better way to introduce this, this whole theme than what you've both said. Um, Nick Burns, Megan O'Sullivan, thank you very much. Aspen Ideas Reset is generously underwritten by MasterCard Center for Inclusive Growth, PayPal, and Prudential. And now let's see what the data has to say. Hello, my name is Tom Orlick. I'm the Chief Economist for Bloomberg, uh, and I'm here to share some thoughts on the prospects for a reset in America's leadership of the global economy. Now, in 1945, America exited victorious from World War II and entered a position of preeminence in the global economy. 
the creation of the International Monetary Fund and World Bank, signing of the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, and the Marshall Fund for the Reconstruction of Europe created the institutions and made the investments which would help shape decades of global prosperity. In 2021, as a new generation of Americans looks forward hopefully to the end of the COVID pandemic, the world looks very different. The US, spared by geography and strength from the worst ravages of World War II, has been one of the economies that suffered most in the COVID catastrophe. As the chart shows, the cost in lives and in treasure has been steep. After four years of America First policies under the Trump administration, reserves of goodwill for America's leadership are starting to run dry. And America's position in the global economic rankings is looking precarious. Projections from Bloomberg Economics suggest that by 2035, China will have claimed the top spot. In Beijing, Xi Jinping isn't waiting around for that to happen. His signature Belt and Road Initiative is already pouring Chinese concrete and expanding Chinese influence around the world. Can America reclaim its position as the global champion of free minds and free markets? The Biden administration would say the answer is yes, and restoring American strength at home will help renew leadership abroad. Analysis by Bloomberg Economics suggests it's not going to be that simple. We forecast GDP out to 2050 for all the world's major economies. And we looked at two scenarios, globalization unraveling, as it started to do under the Trump administration, or globalization advancing, as many hope it will do under Biden. The results show unraveling of globalization imposes costs on everyone. But for emerging markets like China, still moving towards the global technology frontier, those costs are significantly larger. The dilemma for the Biden administration then is something like this. Restoring American leadership on trade, on climate change, on rebuilding institutions would be good for the world. But by delivering significantly larger benefits to geopolitical rivals, it could also hasten the moment when the US gives up its position as the world's biggest economy and greatest power, squaring the circle between national self-interest and global leadership may be harder than it first appears. There's a sentiment running through the US that global trade hurts our domestic economy. Nina Shanai of American Enterprise Institute makes the case for the importance of global trade, but with a caveat. The rules need a big bang reform to catch up with the new era of globalization. I'm Nina Shanai, and I'm a visiting scholar at the American Enterprise Institute, and I'm also an international trade lawyer. And I believe if done right, global trade can further sustainable and inclusive growth for the United States. So Josh Meltzer, a senior fellow at Brookings and I, have a bipartisan project on reconceptualizing globalization for a few years. So we have thought about what is needed as a path forward. I think we need to consider this a new 1947 type moment. And why I'm mentioning 1947 is this was the year, that was the year that the General Agreements on Tariffs and Trade was negotiated. And in the aftermath of the World War, the world was hungry for leadership, for U.S. leadership, and I think we are, again, at a juncture like that. I think there are two major areas that we can look at in terms of resetting the trade rules and thinking about the future. The first is at home. I think politicians here in the United States need to be honest with Americans about the effects of trade policies. So for example, tariffs. What are the effects of tariffs? And is it clear that Americans are in fact paying the tariffs that are imposed? Or binational policies, which may make for good talking points, but in fact may not have the intended consequences of increasing economic activity at home. Second, the United States should seek 
to initiate a new Big Bang set of new rules globally, whether it's through the WTO or outside the WTO. If it's in the WTO, we also need to seek some strong institutional reforms at the WTO. And I think the new negotiations need to take into account the new geopolitical power dynamics. Perhaps we need to look uh, at how the consensus-based system in the past, which has prevented deals, um, can be overcome. And a way we can do that in this broader set of trade negotiations is to have a series of a la carte, so to speak, type of deals w under the context of the WTO, if we go in that direction. And they can be sectoral deals, so areas where the U.S. has competitive advantage. As big and strong as we are, we can't do this alone. Aspen Ideas Reset is about asking big questions and offering big solutions. Let's now hear from some voices across America about their thoughts and personal experiences with today's topic. When I buy things, do I care where it's made? Um, in theory, yeah, but I don't pay that much attention. I do care where it's made because I want to support people domestically. Yeah, it matters. Where it's made, who made it, definitely American stuff, uh, black owned stuff. I do try and support specific communities that relate to me. I would prefer to buy things made in my own country to support my own country's economy. If things are made outside of my country, I would prefer that they were made uh, in places that have favorable conditions for their workers. I'll buy from outside of the United States. It's a global economy. I do definitely care that it's a sustainable, it's sustainable for the environment and it's sustainable for the people who run that business and the people who work there. I mean, you vote with your wallet, so it matters. I understand that we're in a world economy now and I would like to see people give some preference to American-made goods. Um, I understand that, you know, that there's a difference in cost, but the only way that we can support our own American economy is, is if we make some effort to do that as Americans. I, I think we should try, try to find a way to do trade in a fair way between both countries. One thing that I would like the U.S. government to do on China is to uh, be pretty hardline about the um, Uyghur concentration camps. We should take a stance on that and um, be really firm in um, our relationship to those humanitarian issues. I think our government should try to form a long-term strategic relationship with China because China is the second largest country in the world in terms of like economic output and production. We need to be able to collaborate with them in order to have a more sustainable future. Up next, we'll explore the U.S.'s complex economic relationship with China as two leaders in the world economy emerge out of a global pandemic. After years of hardline approaches, how will Biden reset our China policy? Three experts on China will discuss the entwined future of two global superpowers. Hello, my name's Tom Orlick. I'm the Chief Economist for Bloomberg. Uh, and I'm very glad to welcome you to this panel discussion on a reset in China-US relations. Now, it feels like a lot of things have been broken in the last few years, but perhaps none more so than US-China ties. Can the Biden administration reset the relationship? Well, that's a big question. And there aren't many people who are going to be better placed to help us answer it than my guests today. Joining us from Hong Kong is Chang Shu, Bloomberg Economics Chief Asia Economist and someone who's deeply plugged in to the economic policy conversation in Beijing. And dialing in from Illinois is Dave Rank. Dave leads the China practice at the Cohen Group, helps educate the next generation of diplomats teaching a class at Yale, and recently ended a storied career at the State Department, which culminated in a position as the Chargé d'Affaires in the U.S. Embassy in Beijing. Dave, let me start with you. What aspects of the Trump approach to China do you expect the Biden team to keep? And what do you think they're going to jettison? Thanks. Gosh, maybe I'll start on the jettisoning part first, because it's, it may be the easier one to answer. 
And, and I think the big one uh, er, earlier this month, it took a long time, but but President Biden uh, had a phone call with uh, uh, President Xi. And to me, that was a big deal. First of all, it was uh, getting back to sort of the regular rhythm of diplomacy that you saw before uh, uh, the Trump administration. But probably more importantly, it was a sign that the Biden administration was jettisoning the uh, at least tacit effort at regime change or advocacy for regime change that you saw in the Trump administration. And uh, I, I think that's a big deal. It, it went, uh, didn't really, uh, hasn't been noted much here in the United States, but I think the Chinese have picked up on that. Uh, what, what hasn't changed and probably won't change is uh, the tech competition between the United States and China. Uh, I think it's probably actually going to get more acute uh, in the Biden administration as the Biden administration does a better job of harnessing uh, the uh, the various parts of the national security bureaucracy in Washington, something the Trump administration frankly wasn't very good at. But I think the test of what's on the uh, what's right in the middle is is what happens to all of those tariffs and at which you know if you look at the phase one trade deal, these hundreds of, of billions of dollars of tariffs and and the promises. I mean, from a empirical sense, uh, uh, it's been a failure that, that uh, you know, most of the costs were borne by the United States and American consumers and not by the Chinese, as the Trump administration said, and the, the trade deficit's the same place it was uh, when, when the Trump administration started. But the politics are tough, and I think that's going to be the real challenge uh, for the Biden administration. Chang, what are the early signs coming out of Beijing? Do you think the Xi team have taken comfort from some of the early indications from the Biden team? Uh, my sense is that at this point, uh, there's a lot of caution on China's side, not so much optimism. Uh, there's um, uh, wide recognition among um, Chinese, uh, ordinary Chinese people and uh, the top um, Chinese leadership that the uh, China-US relationship has changed fundamentally. The strategic uh, competition between the two countries will stay with the current administration and beyond. Uh, a, this doesn't seem to be a, a much of a honeymoon period, unlike uh, in the previous uh, administration. Uh, in the Chinese media, there are limited reports on um, Biden's long-term relationship with China. I think that's a reflection of the caution. Dave, let me come back to you. Um, it seems like the Biden team is going to try and compartmentalize to say, we fundamentally disagree with what's going on in Xinjiang. We have different interests in the South China Sea. We have different interests in who owns the future of technology, but we want to work with you on climate change. And we want substantial parts of the trade and financial relationship to remain somewhat robust. Is that practical? Uh, well, certainly, it's. I think it's the right approach to come in and say, as, as I think the Biden folks have said, that we can walk and chew gum at the same time. In other words, that we can have fundamental and deep uh, disagreements on issues, you point out, uh, human rights, uh, South China Sea, uh, and still recognize that, look, our economies are deeply integrated. Aspects, particularly in, in technology, uh, have real national security implications, and we're going to have to figure that out. Uh, given the, I think, recognition on both sides of the Pacific of the uh, of the uh, strategic competition that's likely to be part of the relationship for a long time, and I think uh, I think that's uh, a very doable kind of com compartmentalization uh, on climate. I'm actually kind of relaxed on the uh, uh, about uh, the the idea that the United States and China uh, can cooperate on climate, not because China's doing favors for the United States, but because from the outset, China has taken action on climate because it's, it's been in its interest to do so. That both from a sort of global le or from a global level where, you know, China aspires to a position of global leadership and you don't need to look much farther than Donald Trump to realize that if you're not leading on climate, it's going to be hard to lead uh, globally. But also at a domestic level, uh, China understands that, that uh, you know, of all the countries exposed to the risks from climate change, uh, they're particularly vulnerable. Uh, and they have a population that demands action. Chang, if the world wants to get to grips with the problem of climate change, they need China on board. In China, President Xi has set the target of doubling the size of the economy by 2035. Can he achieve that target 
without the world on board? Or is China now advanced enough to go it alone, even if the US stays in a hostile stance? China has in, achieved very impressive growth in the past four decades, and, and uh, the increasing interactions between China and the rest of the world is an important aspect, uh, an important driver for that. You talked about this ambitious plan of doubling China's uh, economy by uh, 2035. Uh, that would imply an annual growth of around 5%. We um, at Bloomberg Economics, we did our projections, our own uh, medium term projection, and the official target or implied growth is consistent with our, our projection. But the projection, our projection is based on a number of assumptions. The assumptions are China continues its economic reform and uh, the external environment remains blind. Yes, China is growing stronger and there's a growing focus on the domestic economy, yet the external environment remains very important. The um, trade, external trade, remains an important driver of China's growth. Uh, we did um, uh, some more risky scenario where um, there's a, a trade war and, uh, and uh, the um, exchanges uh, in other areas, particularly in technology, are, um, are cut off. In those scenarios, China's growth will be much slower, and uh, the the uh, the target of achieving um, the doubling the economy will be much harder to achieve. Dave, come back, coming back to you, um, one of the messages we hear consistently from the Biden team is they want to work with friends and allies on the China question. But even as the Biden team were preparing to come into office, we saw Europe moving to sign an ambitious investment deal with China, further cementing those bilateral ties. Is it possible to envision a kind of alliance of advanced democracies on China issues? Or is the appeal, is the sort of the gravitational pull of the China market so strong that actually that alliance is never going to hold? Well, I, I think it's, it's possible to envision one. In fact, I think it's important to envision that kind of alliance, even though I think uh, it's really unlikely that that uh, the Biden administration or any American administration will achieve all of the goals, achieve all of the sort of targets that it's laid out for. But ultimately, I, I think the, the alignment of interests, both in terms of the values that we share with the European Union, but also in terms of the, uh, the purely commercial interests uh, 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 that, that the United States and Europe share uh, in the sense of how do we, we collectively deal with the economic and commercial model that China is putting forward. That's a real challenge to both of our economies. Obviously, uh, you know, uh, uh, it's great that the U.S. is back and interested in, in uh, global leadership. But, you know, we're going to have to talk to the Europeans. The Europeans are going to have their own views. And on some things, I think we're going to have to agree to disagree. The U.S. maintaining and rebuilding credibility in terms of its long term commitments, obviously a big challenge for the incoming Biden team. Um, Chang, what's the one signal that we should be looking for in the weeks and months ahead? What's the one thing that you're looking for that would tell us what kind of trajectory US-China um, relations are on for the next four years? Uh, if I have to pick one thing, possibly it's the Taiwan issue. If the US signals it's going to continue to uphold the One China uh, principle, that's going to die down the um, the, uh, the the tense relationship significantly. Um, I, I think um, obviously the clear way forward, uh, like Dave has been um, in discussing, the is for the uh, two sides to start talking, um, communicating uh, is the first important step. If there's any hope of resolving uh, some differences or in some shape or form. The $300 billion in tariffs, do you think they'll still be there in a year's time? 
I think uh, I think it will be really difficult in the environment in Washington to remove those quickly. So I think the Biden administration appropriately will take time to review what's go, uh, you know, a lot and and find out what has happened uh, within the government over the past four years. Uh, and then they will turn to what do we remove? What do we change? But that's going to be tough in the environment in Washington these days. Well, how will U.S.-China relations evolve under the Biden administration? As Zhou Enlai famously said about the French Revolution, it's too early to say. Um, but Dave Chang, you've helped us look as far into the future as it's possible to do at this point. Thanks so much for sharing your insights. Global supply chains are something the average consumer only thinks about when the chains break, like we saw at the start of the pandemic. What can companies do to ensure their supply chains withstand global crises so that we have enough food on our shelves and respirators in our hospitals during a pandemic? Hear now from a leader building resiliency into their global pipeline. I'm John Banovitz, the Senior Vice President of Innovation and Stewardship here at 3M, that when the world has needed us, 3M has been there. We began ramping up production of our critical PPE and N95 masks over a year ago. And now we're making more than 95 million respirators a month in the United States, quadrupling our production in a year. Well, COVID-19 has been a test of preparedness for the entire world, markets, everything. And 3M was prepared for a pandemic because we've created in our manufacturing and supply chains a, a certain level of surge capacity for N95s that was ready in the US because we've gone through things like SARS and H1N1 in the past. This pandemic just reinforces the need for strong manufacturing and supply chains and great relationships with suppliers so that they can ramp up their production when needed. But it's also reinforced how important it is to have strong relationships with regulatory and government trade authorities as well. Throughout the pandemic, we've learned a lot about resilient global supply chains and what it takes to create and build and maintain them. Things that aren't really recognized around the supply chain is the data and information flow that has to happen between the end users and the producers within that supply chain. And this is actually an area where I think the, the governments around the world can really step up and, and fill this need. And so that we can actually focus our production and make sure that we can drive our production to where it's highest need in the market. We actually put together a lot of those thoughts and ideas and put together a policy paper around that. That paper talks a little bit about things like national stockpile and management of it, price fraud and fighting price gouging counterfeits in the marketplace, as well as minimizing trade barriers. We've shared this report with the Biden administration and we look forward to sharing it with any other policymakers. Aspen Ideas Reset is generously underwritten by MasterCard Center for Inclusive Growth, PayPal, and Prudential. Up next, wealth inequality, which isn't just the gap between economic groups and individual countries. It's also a growing chasm between developed and less developed countries. And the less developed ones will have a harder time recovering from both this recession and pandemic. Dr. Rajiv Shah of the Rockefeller Foundation and our own Dan Porterfield will talk about how the U.S. can and should step up to help. Hi, I'm Dan Porterfield, President and CEO of the Aspen Institute. We're here today with Dr. Rajiv Shah, who is the President of the Rockefeller Foundation and served as USAID Administrator in the Obama Administration. We're talking about global income inequality worsening in a time of COVID. So let's just jump right into it. What concerns you right now about the current trajectory of the global economy? Well, the biggest concern I have is that COVID-19 has been an extraordinary force for divergence in the global economy. And by all accounts over the next two to three years, I think you will see that divergence accelerate unless we do something about it. And specifically what I mean by divergence is, you know, if you look at the world's 2,200 billionaires, they've made an extra $2 trillion in the last year, uh, while about 425 million people are being pushed back under an expanded definition of the global poverty line. We've lost almost two decades of human development gains uh, against the sustainable development goals for a variety of reasons, but most notably the impact of COVID-19 on the health, welfare, and the economy of so many emerging and lesser developed nations that have not had the capacity to both stimulate their economies and also mount the kind of public health response 
that's absolutely critical right now. And you've spoken and written about the tremendous disparities emerging out of the 2008 recession for developed, developing and emerging economies. Um, what were some of the mistakes that we made then, if you look back, and can we avoid re replicating them today? Well, you know, having lived through that, I, there are so many things we tried to do that were aimed in the right direction, but not sufficient enough to really make a tremendous difference. So, for example, coming out of the L'Aquila, you know, summit, the G20 summit, uh, during that crisis, there was strong global action and coordinated economic action. Uh, but frankly, it wasn't powerful enough, especially for the world's lesser developed and emerging economies. And we saw people get pushed back into hunger and poverty through a correlated food crisis in that moment. The lesson for us now is we really do need to reinvigorate the use of the International uh, Monetary Fund, the World Bank, and a series of other international financial institutions and allow economies to really invest in a, in a just and a green recovery. If you look at what OECD countries have done, they've done somewhere between 20 and 30 percent of GDP in the form of stimulus, inclusive of, of scored monetary policy. And if you compare that to large emerging economies around the world, they've done about 6 percent. And if you look at about 60 to 70 lesser developed nations, they've done 2 percent of GDP and they don't have central banks to do monetary action. So the reality is the toolkit has become very limited for the majority of the world's nations. And we need to reinvest in a global coordinated effort to enable those countries to invest in a just and a green recovery while mounting a much better and a much more effective response to COVID-19. Let's turn to COVID. You are one of the world's experts on vaccine delivery. And when you were with the Bill and Linda Gates Foundation, you created uh, the International Financing Facility for Immunization. Um, so what, do you, what is the prognosis right now for our being able to achieve herd immunity around the world, especially in vulnerable communities, uh, to get out of this, uh, this terrible crisis that we're in? Well, right now in this moment, it's looking fairly difficult uh, to achieve herd immunity through vaccination in a timely way for, say, the three to four billion people who live in emerging economies and developing nations. And the reason for that is we have not had uh, enough investment in the development of capacity to manufacture effective vaccines for everybody all at once. And so you will, in fact, see uh, OECD economies effectively get prioritized. There are some there are some glitches in the international system that some institutions could step up and try to fix, like indemnification to allow middle income countries to get better access to, say, the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines or a rapid standardized testing protocol so that we could evaluate the performance of new emerging vaccines against new emerging uh, COVID-19 variants. And, and make the necessary adjustments to global vaccination strategies. And ultimately, it's about resources. But we've never in the past tried to immunize everyone on the planet all at once. And we just need a much bigger investment in that task that understands it's not just about buying the vaccine and distributing it. In fact, the majority of the cost is for hiring community health workers, for tracking who's gotten vaccinated for making sure people are coming back for their second doses. All of that logistics and human resource work is, is likely to be far more costly than the actual cost of vaccine. And right now we're just barely able to raise the money to enable countries to buy the vaccine at reasonable scale. So there, there needs to be a rethink as to how big this challenge is and how much you know US and other leading nations should be stepping in to do more. Well, the stakes are so high and uh... You know, addressing this is both the right thing to do on a global scale and the smart thing to do, as, of course, the coronavirus COVID-19 knows no borders. Should the U.S. play uh, a different role than we're playing right now on the global uh, vaccination strategy? Yes, absolutely. In fact, Dan, you, you just said it perfectly. I mean, as you see new variants emerge, whether it's in South Africa or Brazil, frankly, we're not looking hard enough, including in the United States, and that I suspect is about to change. But it is highly likely that even if you vaccinate most Americans, if there's huge reservoirs of viral replication in the developing world that go unchecked, new variants will emerge. And at some point they will cause 
problems like the invalidating the immunity effect of certain vaccines. So, uh, so this is in fact a moment when we're all in it together. And like we did back, you know, 15, 20 years ago when we created Gavi and the international finance facility that you mentioned, we need to rethink how we're financing this effort. This is going to be a longer term effort. We need to provide financing for manufacturing and for product development and testing. But we also need to finance distribution. And that is where America has traditionally been the world's leader in global health. You know, we, we stood up and fought an AIDS crisis on a bipartisan basis and largely won. We can do that in this moment, but it will take a, a tremendous amount of leadership and American leadership with all of the institutional participation from partners like the World Bank to make that real. Well, let's hope that the reset that you're calling for has a derivative benefit of sustainable infrastructure gains and public health awareness around the world so that we come out with a stronger system for having met the challenge of this particular crisis. And you know, are there are there actions that you would like to see the uh, both the public and the sort of private sectors in the U.S. take to strengthen our global economy at this time? Yeah, well, you know, if you look at the IMF estimate uh, that twenty eight trillion dollars of global economic value has been and will be lost as a result of COVID-19 and you actually trace that down to who it impacts the most, it is, in fact, vulnerable and working families in every economy across the planet, um, including the United States. And so while we're making these major efforts, a one point nine trillion dollar immediate stimulus, followed certainly by some sort of major infrastructure package in America to create a more equitable recovery. Traditionally, America has been the world's leader in creating that kind of a cooperation approach to the global economy. You know, we're the ones who proposed and executed a Marshall Plan to rebuild after World War II. We need that same kind of aspiration now. And one step in the right direction would be the support, and Rockefeller is doing this, to support the IMF and the World Bank to expand their resourcing for developing and emerging nations to invest in their own recoveries. Perhaps most important, of course, is supporting a climate and energy transition in this moment. You know, any stimulus that's provided uh, around the world should, in fact, uh, have a strong imprint around climate and climate transitions. That's what economies need around the planet. And right now we're losing ground to coal financing of new, in terms of new gigawatts in most of the emerging worlds. And we've launched a series of joint ventures to bring renewable power to the world's poorest communities in India, in Africa, and in Latin America. I've sometimes heard you use the word energy poverty. And, and what does that mean? And, and how does that relate to global income inequality? Well, you know, think about your day uh, today, or for any of our viewers, you need access to electricity and energy. And the reality is about 800 million people have almost no access to electricity. Probably another billion or billion and a half people on top of that experience an erratic and unaffordable access to electricity as their primary constraint to job creation, to growth, to labor productivity improvement. So really to lift up the world's two billion people or two and a half billion people that live in environments that are constrained by energy access, we just have to rethink the energy infrastructure that can allow that part of the global population to move out of poverty and move into a modern global economy. But the truth is we'll, we will not achieve uh, a climate, our climate goals and we certainly won't achieve our poverty reduction goals if we don't attack energy poverty with a sense of purpose and focus for many decades. And that needs to start now and we believe it needs to be an urgent mission in the global economy. Thank you. Let me close with this question. Um, you have worked so on both global income inequality and very much on domestic income inequality in the United States, especially in recent years. And do you see any of the uh, parallels between the two kinds of inequality? And are there any solutions that you'd want to highlight that can address both at the same time? Well, I do think there's a parallel. And, you know, the parallel is that this crisis has caused a, a huge digital acceleration. It has uh, had a very disproportionate impact on, on women in, in the workforce in particular. And while fundamentally a health crisis, it has created a jobs crisis for those who are in the wor you know, working families. That's true in America, that's true all around the world. So a coordinated global jobs-rich effort 
to you know effectively replicate the and modernize the Marshall Plan for this moment in our in our global history is absolutely critical. And we can do that, but we can only do that by investing in a future green economy. And and as as we've heard President Biden say, you know, when he says when he thinks of climate change, he thinks of jobs. And that same mindset has to apply in nation after nation in this moment, because it's the only way to really achieve an inclusive economic recovery. And frankly, it's the only way to allow everybody to be part of a modern, connected global economy that, you know, that is not going to destroy our planet. And I think that is achievable. Dr. Shaw, thank you for joining us. Visionary ideas with a hands-on commitment to getting the job done. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dan. We want to thank you for being a part of this two-day discussion, and we hope that the conversation started here will continue in your communities, your boardrooms, and your local government meetings. And we hope you know that these kinds of discussions are ongoing here at the Aspen Institute, and that we want you to be a part of them from now on. We thank you for taking the time to think about this massive but necessary undertaking. Right now, we have the opportunity and the will to reset the economy, to build it back as something stronger, more resilient, and more inclusive. But we are not done here. Join us for three more interactive sessions. First, join former White House economic advisor, Adrian Harris, Grameen America CEO, Andrea Jung, and MasterCard's Mike Froman about why so many communities seem left behind by economic growth and how we need to send a national agenda for financial inclusion. Or join Reshma Sajani and Betsy Stevenson looking at the employment crisis among women and a proposal to get them back to work through a Marshall Plan for Moms. Then a conversation with Jean Case and Peggy Alford on the state of stakeholder capitalism and its promise moving forward. Great ideas do not belong behind a paywall. If you think the ideas you heard today are worth sharing, please consider supporting the Aspen Institute in our mission to elevate the boldest, most necessary thinkers and put them on a digital stage for all to see. And don't forget, mark your calendars for Aspen Ideas Health on April 27 to 29, 2021, and Aspen Ideas Festival on June 27 to 30, 2021. Thank you for being a part of Aspen Ideas Reset. <laughs>